Welcome to another episode of Justification. Thank you for welcoming me into your home and into your hearts once again. May the morning be blessed to you and may this be an edifying morning for the subject that we will that we will tackle. And the subject we will continue is is sin. And um, it's a it's a difficult, difficult thing to grasp because we're so used to the concept of what we imagine sin to be based on our religious tradition. Or based on what we, even without religious tradition, what we believe naturally is sinful or to be sin. But the main concern, the overall concern, is getting to the root of justification. And there's a lot of pins and points, uh, twists and turns on the roller coaster of justification just to get to understanding its context. And as I promised times before, you know, I can promise you that this will all culminate into something feasible, into something decent and elegant, which is what the words of the Bible are. Despite the, the language, despite the need to exercise power of mind, this is what we are told the living God has given us. Not fear, but love, strength, the living God's grace, and a sound mind. So we have been exercising each and every single one of these things in our meetings. And I'm thankful to you for continuing to tune in, for continuing to be active, for continuing to be responsive, for continuing to take control of your experience in the sense of giving it to the living God and exercising a living faith that you will have returned back to you a living experience with what you are doing and with where you are. And picking up from where we last left off, we will continue this subject at this time of, of sin. Because what we have seen, what we are seeing, not just in our time together, but in our times together previously, is that the definition of sin is not held to the construct that we today would have it as. Maybe in former times, but with the, the dawning of the living God's chief apostle and the crucifixion of this individual, everything changed for the purpose of justification. And learning that sin has an origin, and the origin being philosophical, knowing that the philosophical origin of sin exists, allows us to step outside of that box and to hear a thus saith the Lord. And so it made sense, you know, we, we didn't get into the definition of sin initially, but we reviewed or went into how the Bible defines sin according to the illustration of that crucifixion and how the first apostles taught it. Then we went into the definition of what sin is to this day. And how it, how it has formed and how it has become what it has be, become. A, a biological plague to the human being is what sin now is. Once you step into that, that realm of thought that is outside of the Bible scope. Within the Bible, the definition of sin presently is concrete. We've reviewed, we're going to review a couple of verses um, but we reviewed them before. Now having the, the foundation of where sin traditionally came from, we can put into perspective and think a little bit deeper and a little bit differently about how the Bible would have us view sin at this point in time. And again, we point, we point to Paul, or we turn to Paul in the book of Galatians. Because it is in this book that Paul is defining the present way to view what sin is. The transition that took place was a transition philosophically. There was a philosophical way of acknowledging the living God. There was a philosophical way of acknowledging one's error to the living God and one's error to self. There was a, a way to do it and it was through sacrifices. It was through offerings. It was through routines. It was through baptisms. It was through a belief on theories. But in the book of Galatians, Paul lets us know that something has changed. 
In the book of Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14, Galatians 3 verse 13 and 14, we have reviewed these verses before and now hearing them again, it should sound a little bit different. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of what? Now, according to, if we had to maintain the theory put forth by Augustine of Hippo, Christ hath redeemed us from sin. And the definition of that sin being the biological error within us. Jumping into the Bible, Christ, Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of what? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, at this time, the debate that the first apostles had and maintained was a debate about what sin was. To the first apostles, they broke down the illustration because we've reviewed this before, but Paul is quoting Moses from the book of Deuteronomy. Paul is quoting Moses, cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. Cursed is everyone that is hanged on a tree that hangeth on a tree. Cursed. Looking at this individual that, that was crucified, we can either look at this from two perspectives. The first perspective is that the individual crucified is cursed, flat out. There's nothing more. Nothing more you can do with this individual. If God has cursed someone, you better believe that God has cursed someone for life and for death. There is no coming back. So if this individual is on this is on the tree crucified, and we are literally going to believe what the Bible is saying. He that is hanged is the curse of God. This individual that is crucified is no savior. If we're going to look at this literally, this individual is no savior, and there is no way, there is no logical way to connect this individual to any sort of sonship or saviorhood because if we're going to take the Bible as being legitimate, this individual is cursed by God and is no use. Or, <laughs> or we can look at this the way that the first apostles looked at it. And the way that the first apostles looked at it was that the individual man, his body did not represent a literal body. This man's body represented the philosophy of the religious law. Representing the philosophy of the religious law, to see this man crucified is to see this philosophy crucified. So looking at this in its right context, because if we're going to believe John 4, 24, that God is a spirit, he that is hanged is a curse of God, means physically nothing. The physical means nothing. So the first apostles looking at this understood that if God is a spirit, then what matters to the spirit, but what is also spirit? This is what the man also said, John 3, verse 6, that which is of the spirit is spirit. So to see this body crucified is to understand that a spirit of mind is crucified. The spirit of mind that is crucified, Paul has told us in the book of Galatians. He broke it down for us. The spirit of mind that is crucified, that we are redeemed from, is the philosophy of the religious law. Christ hath redeemed us from the philosophy of the religious law. This would mean that the law or the philosophy of the religious law is the new or has always been the definition of sin to the mind within the Bible. This fact was brought to light by the man himself when he preached. This is why he was crucified. He defied the, the, the philosophy of the religious law of the Jews, showing that it did no thing for the character. 
and Paul carrying on and carrying forward the same philosophy of that one individual breaks down the illustration given by Moses to signify where our minds should be concerning the subject of sin. And this, and this is also interesting because when it does come to this subject, when I do talk about this, when I do break this down, the number one question that I get is, so you, you're going to tell me that all of my time going to church and I do all of the eating of the bread and drinking of the wine, that's sin? So all of the things that represent what that body represents, that's, so I am, I am a sinner in this way, not, not, not what I thought, but I'm a sinner in this way of my performance. And my response is always, according to the Bible, yes. Because sin is direct defiance against the living God's course of learning, direct defiance against the living God's uh, commandment or philosophy or law or judgment for that learning, and d direct defiance of the living God's religious or devotional character. Today, at this point in time, and since this individual was crucified, the illustration of this individual's crucifixion points to the present philosophy of the living God's devotional character. Paul has it right. Paul is breaking this down for us. We are redeemed, and this we, remember, um, times before, times present, the we is not individual, meaning we human beings. This we is a we, meaning a we of our devotional conversations, conscience. The we is for our conversation. We, our conversation, is redeemed, is literate, is, is liber liberated from the law by this one individual's act. The issue for sin is related to what that body is supposed to represent. And to the first apostles, that body, that man's physical body, represented a philosophy of an approach to the living God through rituals and baptisms and rites and belief on theories and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. But the crucifixion of this man's body means the annihilation of that. Romans chapter 4, and this is how we can say that, Romans chapter 4. Because there's a shift. Remember, Paul just mentioned that all of this took place, the redemption uh, from the curse of the law, and and, he, and that the next verse, uh, Galatians 3 verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham may now live. The blessing of Abraham. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 4, sorry. Romans 4 and verse 13. Romans 4 and verse 13 says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, Paul is, Paul is showing the change, the transition in philosophy and in approach that today is relevant. Paul is showing that, yes, Moses was the man. Moses was that superstar. But the time of Moses' religious philosophy has come to an end. And we have now gone back, even though we never should have, but nevertheless, Moses came in and distracted us from the fact of Abraham's, Abraham's religious philosophy. We are now in the dawn and in the rising of Abraham's religious philosophy, which is a philosophy stating a promise to be given and received through faith in the living God, not by any religious law. It was not a religious law that worked for Abraham, is what Paul is saying. Decency to the divine eye did not come by your or any doing or acknowledging of a religious law in this time. And this is what Paul is saying. As it was back then, so is it now again.
And so Paul is very explicit on what the definition of sin is presently and what it should be looked at as in the lens and the scope to look at it through. Turning to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56, this is explicit. Like this is plain. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56, it says, The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. This is the controversy of the philosophy that the first apostles were giving. The strength of sin is the law. Sin equals the law. And this law, the law of Moses. And the law of Moses equaling to a routine or manual given by any priest or pen of the priest to dictate how an approach to the living God should be. Now, this is important. This is important. Because the crucifixion of this man's body representing the crucifixion of the philosophy of the religious law Meaning, the definition of sin being acknowledged as the philosophy of the religious law and the religious law in and of itself allows us to understand that there is now a better way to go about approaching the experience the living God would have for the devotional conversation. Now, all of this was, was foretold, all of, all of this was thought of, all of this was predicted or, as they say, prophesied. Throughout the Bible, this, this change in this transition. We've, we've gone through a couple of verses previously, but we'll review some in the book of Isaiah. Now in the book of Isaiah chapter 1, the book of Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. The book of Isaiah chapter 1, 11 through 14. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he-goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Now remember, we, we reviewed in the book of Jeremiah how it is written in the book of Jeremiah, I have never once counseled your fathers on sacrifices, but told them to obey my voice. Returning back to the book of Isaiah 1, now verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity. Now what? Another word for iniquity is sin. Another word for iniquity is sin. So everything that we have just read, read it again. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of rams or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity. It is sin. Even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth, they are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Everything that this just has just said is everything that the man's body represents figuratively. And when the first apostles saw this, when the first apostles understood the context of what Moses was saying, every one that hangeth on a tree is the curse of God. When the apostles understood the context of what Moses was saying, they understood what that body represented. They understood the error, the religious and philosophical error that body represented as an approach to the living God. They understood this and they preached it. And Paul, in every single one of his letters, in some way or some fashion, eloquently articulates this fact of how we today should be approaching the living God and how we today should be mindful of what the definition of sin is. And it is not as if a, it is sin that a divine eye will not have it. It is as a sin because our experience will suffer the more that it is tied down and bogged down to the former, in the book of Ephesians, as he says, chapter 4, the former conversation and its diet. This diet is a routine to keep our mind away from actually experiencing the regeneration that comes from exercising our faith on words, on words. And again, 
we turn or we remain in the book of Isaiah. We remain in the book of Isaiah, traveling to chapter 66, the book of Isaiah 66, and traveling to verse 3. So we're traveling to the book of Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 3, again, explicit. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. Again, all of this has been prophesied to be not only cut off, but to be looked at by the living God as abominable, as unjust, as unnecessary. So when I do get those reactions, and you can tell me that I've been going to church and all of these things I've been doing, the eating of this and the drinking of that and the doing this and the doing that, and they, they do all of this, this is the definition of sin. And then my response is, to the Bible's mind, this is not my definition of sin. To the Bible's mind, this is the definition of sin, what you have been experiencing and what you have been doing. And this is the definition of sin because this routine is taking away from our living experience from the words that are within the Bible. That may sound weird uh, due to how things are set up and due to how we perceive what religion is and what spirituality should be thought of as, but when it comes to the mind within the Bible, strictly, this is not me. This is, this is what is within the Bible. When it comes to the mind within the Bible, and when it comes to how the minds within the Bible interpret the mind that is within the Bible, well, we're only left with two options. We can continue with what we believe to be true, or we can acknowledge what is true and learn its culture. Now, for the sincere individual, for the sincere individual, learning the culture that, that is within the Bible is, is prime. Like, there is nothing greater than that. Like, nothing else exists. And especially for the individuals that do reach out to me, that I do have conversations with, that are not uh, content with where their spirituality has led them or where their religious conversation has them at and, and really wants more, really wants to understand the character or the nature of the living God's mind that is within the Bible. Allowing them to understand that and showing them from the Bible that it is well and it is, it's fair to take the words that are within the Bible and to exercise them, to get a meaning of them, and then to have that meaning develop a knowledge that you can keep as a principle and to have that principle be the guiding factor of your faith and to have that guiding factor of your faith allow you to move with the living God genuinely as your heart beats for you and you don't have to think about it. As your ears work for you, you don't have to think about it. As your legs work for you, you don't have to think about it. That's the same way that our faith should be. And the routine that the, the Bible is now presently educating us on, that the first apostles and especially Paul is educating us on, is that it is a routine not through a philosophy based on a religious law or the doing of a religious law or the holding of a religious law or deed or routine or celebration or holy or holiday as something to allow the divine eye to grant us favor. It is the course of Abraham that now allows us the favor of the living God. And not just now, it has always existed. But the time came where this philosophy should resurface, and it has resurfaced in quite perfectly. And again, Paul is articulating this to the point. Everything that this individual's body represents is the definition of sin and what we have been reviewing is what the definition of sin is to the bible's mind the definition of sin in sin is has to do with the offerings and the sacrifices whether they are blood or bloodless on a regular basis for a philosophy of religion and this has become the law of the religion and this is established by the pen of priest or priests this is the definition of sin. And if we are doing this, we are sinners and we are violating the present commandment and character of the living God as shown through the illustration of his crucified 
chief minister. And so it's absolutely fascinating. It, it's really fascinating. And remaining, you no, know, jumping to the book of Hosea. We'll come back to Isaiah. Hosea chapter 2. Again, this is, this is very explicit in nature. Of, of what the definition of sin is and should be looked at as. Hosea chapter 2 verse 11. Hosea chapter 2 verse 11 reads, I will also cause her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her sabbaths, and her solemn feasts. This is a fraction or a part of what that body crucified, annihilated. Book of Isaiah, more explicit. Hosea just pronouncing it. The book of Isaiah again, Isaiah 29, because this, this again, this has been prophesied and th this, this has a point. There's a point to all of this. The Bible's preparing us to accept a change in thought and a change in approach to the living God. Plain and simple. Isaiah 29, verse 13 and 14, we have reviewed this verse or these verses before. Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14 reads, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but I remove their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by what? The, their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. And this is where the transition comes in. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Now, the wisdom that, that is to be hid, the wisdom that is to be taken away, is the wisdom that was crucified. What was crucified may have been a man, but the first apostles looked at it as it should have been. It was not a man that was crucified in right context. In right context, it was a wisdom, a philosophical wisdom, an approach to the living God that was no longer relevant and that was, if continued, leaving the individual unjust in their experience to the living God. This taken out of the way, this annihilated, allows the individual to have a resurrected conversation and this might and now now it you know it connects a resurrected conversation or a, or a regenerated conversations conscience to guide the experience into understanding a newness of mind everything that we have been reviewing it all it all ties into one it, it all ties into one sound band leading us to understand justification according to the bible